Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Denise Flight. I am a new member of the Executive Committee of the World Council, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you your keynote speaker of the session, Dr. Peter Charmé, who will present a lecture on the network concept of creativity and talent support. Dr. Uh, Peter Charmé is a professor of the Salvais University in Budapest, Hungary, where he studies network and talent support. He is also the, Euro the president of the European Council for High Ability, ETCHA. Um, he, is, um, he wrote and edited 15 books and published 20 to 212 research papers. He's also received the 2004 Descartes Award of the European Union. And in 2000, he started the Network of Youth Excellence with Leon Lederman, Nobel Laureate. Please uh, welcome Dr. Peter Charmé. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's my pleasure and honor to talk to you about two very important words in my life. One of them is networks, which is my profession, and the other one is talent support, which is my lifetime calling and best hobby. Uh, in the title, you actually see a third word, which is creativity. And, well, creativity is a difficult concept. Two years ago, I visited a country when I was invited to the best high school of the country. And the students in that high school were really brilliant. They were winning various competitions, including the Olympics in mathematics, in physics, in chemistry. They were winning uh, competitions in history, in literature, whatever type of competition you can uh, imagine, they were winning it. And that was my audience for my lecture. Uh, and the lecture was about talent. And after my lecture, I was approached by the students, and the students asked me, the professor, we learned that you are able to stay for the afternoon as well. Could you teach us creativity? Whoa. Uh, creativity is difficult to get told, uh, but it's quite uh, important to get a hold of this concept. So the first part of my lecture will deal with creativity. And actually, I will try to introduce a concept uh, between networks and creativity. Well, there are two sides of creativity, as it has been already wonderfully introduced and, and discussed by Todd Lubert in his plenary lecture. And the first side of creativity, what came to your mind immediately, or came to everyone's mind, actually, is the side which is related to surprise, is the side which is related to exploration, originality. Uh, it's something of a young type of behavior. It's, it's a young playfulness, actually. And eventually, I will call it also as a plastic behavior. Plastic in the sense of complex systems, plastic in the sense of networks what govern our brain. And I will give you some uh, uh, ex uh, examples uh, to prove this. There is another side of creativity. However, I keep hold on, because this side will come only a few minutes later. However, first, I would like to give you a quotation uh, of a famous Hungarian educator, Farkas Bolyai, who lived several centuries ago. And he had a son called Janos Bolyai. And Janos Bolyai was a genius in mathematics. Uh, and Farkas Bolyai told about the education of his own son that first and foremost, the child must grow and play since endless instructions will suppress the strengths of growth and will make the mind empty, like an abandoned road. So even this very kind of early example of practical teaching of creativity and, 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 and uh, um, high uh, achievement, to ability for high achievement, stressed playfulness as a very important ingredient. Well, playfulness is actually a development of curiosity and engagement. And you can eventually see it in, in the animal world as well, not only uh, with humans. Uh, 
the network concept of creativity was first formulated by, by a very famous French mathematician called Henri Poincaré approximately 100 years ago in his book uh, called Foundation of Science, in, published in 1908, where Poincaré wrote that to create consists in not making useless combinations but among chosen combinations, the most fertile, and this is the important part, will often be those formed of elements drawn from domains which are far apart. Now, this very last point is the very important point. If you combine domains of human knowledge which are far apart, that will be quite unusual. To combine, combine knowledge which, are, which is close, quite close to each other, that is of novelty, but, or may be of novelty, but may not be of originality, of the level of high creativity. However, if you combine parts of knowledge which are far apart, that then you might have a chance that you will achieve something which is really new. Uh, another way to to exercise this type of knowledge, acquire knowledge which is far apart, to build a social network which enables you to get knowledge which is dissimilar, which is not the same, which can be combined in the Poincaré's sense. So the network concept of creativity also tells something about social networks when there are groups of people with identical or similar type of values, similar type of background knowledge, but there are persons uh, who are actually tying these groups together, who are serving as bridges between distant groups in the society. And once again, the emphasis is on distant. If you are able to have a level of uh, cognitive flexibility, that you understand very different people from each other at the same time, then you are able to talk their language. And I'm not talking about English or German now, but their language of their background, their, their real language within the English language or within their mother tongue. And if you are able to talk their language, then you are able to understand them, and then you are able to combine their ideas in a creative way, in a, in a way which is actually enriching both groups which you connect as a bridge. This is getting increasingly difficult in our world because network uh, 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 measurements are actually tell us that polarization is increasing in our world. Well, first I was kind of sad about my own country, Hungary, that the parties, left-wing, right-wing parties in Hungary are getting polarized. But then I learned that actually the Congress in the United States is getting polarized. The, uh, the European Parliament is getting polarized. So this polarization is quite general, or seems to be quite general. So it is increasingly important to tie these kind of views because if you are able to do that, that is what allows you to this type of social creativity or this type of kind of network creativity to exercise. Now, the last point which I would like to stress comes from two roots, two origins. One of them is the uh, strategy of the dolphin or dolphins. Uh, it's published a few years ago, approximately 20 years ago, so it's not new, uh, but also relates to the creativity with capital C formulated by Csikszentmihalyi. Both actually tell you the same story. I'm, I'm telling you with the dolphin story that there are two types of animals in this dolphin story, carps and sharks. Carps are the fishes who are waiting to accomplish their fortune, and their fortune is actually their misfortune. They will be eaten by the sharks or by the, by the other predator animals. Uh, so this world is largely polarized to two segments. Either you suffer or you enjoy, and nothing else in between. Now, dolphins in this kind of formulation are having the other way around. 
they are actually conquering a different dimension, the dimension of air, because they are jumping out from this kind of zoo, from this kind of primitive behavior that you are either eaten or you are eating others, and they are behaving completely differently, exercising creativity on the square because they are not only combining existing possibilities, but they are exploring, they are, they, are, they are opening a completely new field of game, and they are actually inviting others to join them if they can. Now, this is creativity with capital C, and if you can really explore this new space, and you can open this new space for the others, then you are entitled to, uh, for, this, for this capital C type of creativity, I believe. Now, turning back to the two sides of creativity, you may wonder what is the other, but definitely you know it. It is quite the opposite of that plastic side, which was characterized by playfulness, surprise, and exploration. It is mostly characterized by the old wisdom by the experience, by the quality. And it is actually an optimization of that exploration process which took place during the playfulness stage. This kind of, this side of creativity was very nicely also summarized by Todd Lubert as context appropriate or meaningful creativity. These words are describing the very same type of, um, uh, of, of creativity uh, concept. However, I would like to stress that you have to take these two parts at the same time. So you have to exercise both to get real creativity. Eventually, it is not something in the middle which is the optimal, but it is dynamic. So you have to behave at one certain moment in one way, being playful, being young, and behave at the next moment in the other way around, criticize your former kind of solutions, select the best one from it, optimize it, and therefore, it is the best if you behave like a young person each even day and you behave like an old person in each odd day. Or actually, you behave like a young person each even moment or, and behave like an old person in each odd moment. So our children has to learn, have to learn actually both type of behavior. And we have to learn their behavior as well. So we have to learn their playfulness, and they have to learn our wisdom. And if the two are combined, that's kind of, well, that, 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 then, then we are quite well off. Uh, how to exercise both sides of creativity? Now, there will be some interesting concepts, at least for me, uh, from the complexity science, from the network science. I will give you first an overview. There are two types of systems in complexity, including ourselves, like human persons, uh, including the society, including the molecules which are building us up. One type of system is quite rigid, rigid like this table. This rigid system is built up to, for an optimized function. This table holds this computer. That is the optimized function. That is very good because the rigid system can actually remember to this optimized function and can perform this optimized function with a high efficiency. However, there is a problem. This rigid system cannot change because it is rigid. So there is another type of system which is flexible, and I am illustrating it with this kind of flexible plastic jumping brains, as you can Google it if you want, uh, which can be of any color and, uh, and, and, and illustrate very well the kind of plasticity which is important. A plastic system like my coat is, is actually accommodating anything what, 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 it, what it touches. I mean, now it's accommodating my shape. If I would give it to you, then it would accommodate your shape. So it is very useful for accommodation, for adaptation to different systems. 
But it is useless if it, turn, if it comes for memory. It doesn't have any memory. I mean, this, this code I mean, can accommodate to whatever you want, but it will not remember to the shape uh, uh, what it acquired the moment before. So eventually, you have to once again combine these two types of behavior, rigidity and plasticity, to get the optimum. That's the balanced way, that's the kind of balanced mind. But once again, this balance is not static, but it is dynamic. So eventually complex systems change from rigidity to plasticity and change back from plasticity to rigidity all the time. And when they do it, and when they turn to, from rigid to plastic, they are actually acquiring a playful competence a competence for play, play playing, a competence for exploration, which is very important. On the other hand around, if they are turning from, rig from plastic to rigid, then they acquire wisdom or memory. They become memory competent, and they can actually, in this way, optimize the behavior, what they acquired, what they explored before. They can select the optimum. Now, I will tell you some examples when this kind of duality of plastic and rigid behavior can be observed in different complex systems. My very first example are metabolism, human metabolism, how we digest actually food, what we eat. There are two types of people according to measurements. One type of person or one type of animal, this is true for animals as well, so it's quite general in biology, is accommodated or has been accommodated to low resources. Whatever food I can get under conditions with low resources that I have to cherish because I don't, probably I will not have a chance to get enough food tomorrow because resources are low. Therefore, the metabolism of these persons and animals is of high efficiency. We digest everything, 100%, almost 100%, whatever we eat under these conditions, because we require to, because there is low resources. On the other hand, there is another type of behavior when resources are high. I can eat each day whatever quantity I want, because I got used to that, because circumstances allow me to eat as much as possible. Under these conditions, the metabolism is very inefficient. Doesn't digest the food 100%, it digests 10% or 20% of the food and just get the rest away because it doesn't need it. I mean, I can eat more if I want. I mean, I got used to that. So it is very important or very interesting that we can change this behavior, and animals can also change this behavior, only after two, three generations. So it doesn't go from one day to the other. And this makes actually quite many diseases, like diabetes, for example, or obesity, because if you got used to resources which were low, but in the meantime, you got high resources, you eat as much as possible because you like or you want, but you use it with 100% efficiency. So you use it all. And the result? Well, the result will be this. Uh, so uh, no wonder that we are suffering from diseases which are consequences of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and all these civilization diseases, because we are not that creative. We are not that flexible as we should be to accommodate ourselves to the changing resources from low to high or from high to low. Now, this is also true at the society level. There is a famous Hungarian economist called Janos Kornai, and he will publish a book in this fall, and I, and I uh, encourage you to, to watch out for this book at Oxford University Press. The title will be Dynamism, Rivalry, and the Surplus Economy, and the last words are the most important one. Janos Kornai is known as an economist who was uh, um, kind of summarizing the economy of socialism as a, um, an economy of shortage. Because in socialism, in the eastern part of Europe, uh, there was a shortage of goods, the shortage of labor, 
well, a shortage of intelligence, but okay, don't for forget about that. Uh, and all this was actually resulting a quite rigid society, which we call socialism uh, in the Eastern European sense or in the, in the historical sense, fortunately, most of, m mostly by now. Uh, I learned it. Uh, I, I was living in it, so I, I really know that it was rigid. On the contrary, capitalism is much more plastic. It is a surplus society, as also Cornoy described it, because it does have a surplus in the economy, a surplus of labor, a surplus of money, a surplus of possibilities, which is actually inflicting or involving or, or evolving rivalry in the economy, and it is giving you or giving us innovation. Now, this is once again two types of systems, a rigid system and the plastic system. And once again, if the plasticity or the rigidity goes to the extreme, that may not be that helpful, but something of a kind of combined uh, uh, history uh, may teach you some examples. Last but not least, my example will be about human thinking, about our brain. There were fMRI uh, measurements, so measurements of the activity of persons, of, of human persons, which showed that neurons, neural cells in our brain are behaving during a learning process in a very interesting way. First, our neurons are becoming more plastic compared to the original state because they are exploring the possibilities, how to respond to this learning process, how to acquire this new knowledge. But after then, with exercising, they are becoming much more rigid because the brain already learned how to make it, how to respond to this challenge, how to exercise this particular task, what has been given, and it is actually an optimum. And that optimum is coming with a more rigid structure of the brain. Even more interesting example is how birds learn to sing. How many of you are familiar with birds? Bird watchers, hands up. There are few in the, in the room, so we share probably this knowledge that male birds have a life or death question in their life and that is how well they can learn to sing. Because if you are not able to sing well and you are a male bird, then you will not have a wife. I mean, sad news. No female birds will select you if you are unable to sing well. And I'm very happy that I'm not a bird because my singing abilities are really bad and therefore I would be really in a trouble. Uh, however, we are talking now about birds and if you are listening to the, or if you are watching the uh, right-hand side part of the figure on the top, you see the beauty of the song. It can be actually measured. Uh, it's quite interesting, or it was quite interesting for me, that if you measure the complexity of the song, then you can actually measure the beauty of the song. So, as the young boy bird was entering to the scene in one day, he learned a better song by the end of the day as he was singing in the morning. But what was the surprise in the, in the, in the, in the studies that came during the night? If you watch the, the, the figure on the, on the top right, you can see a drop in the middle. That was the night, the very first night. That poor bird was forgetting almost completely the beauty of his song, what he learned in the first day. Now you may wonder, was evolution that bad that really com com developed this type of learning ability, which is forgetting almost everything by the second day? If you analyze it in a longer run, then you can see that the bird was going upwards but forgot the, the, the song for the next day, but then started again, went up to even higher. Forget a little bit, fortunately not all of that, at the second day and went up even higher and higher and higher and higher. And the take home message is if the birds did, weren't let to forget their first song, then they were stick to their first song, which was much worse than their last one. So if you stick to your first idea 
and don't let you to forget it, then you will not get your second. I mean, that first idea will be your last in your life. Uh, so this bird kind of way of singing, I mean, the learning process teaches us a very important lesson because actually the brain of these birds was doing right the same as the brain of the human, I mean, persons during the experiment. It was becoming more rigid on the, uh, by the end of the first day because it acquired a certain song, but it became more plastic during the night, during the sleep, because it forgot that song. And then it learned again, becoming more rigid and then more plastic and rigid and plastic. And actually, this is a learning process which is very efficient. You can actually prove it even mathematically that this is a very uh, efficient optimization process in mathematics. This is actually the most efficient optimization process in mathematics. So this is very much resembling me to the joyful learning uh, introduced by Sully Reis and the self-regulated learning uh, wonderfully summarized in the previous speaker, Christian Fisher. Uh, last kind of approach uh, about the exercise of both sides of creativity that misdirected creativity can occur if you block this cycle at any point. Uh, if you block the cycle at the point of plasticity, so you give a lot of instructions and these instructions are very rigid, then you didn't allow playfulness. So that's bad enough, then the cycle was blocked. If you only allow playfulness and you don't give any chance to kind of um, um, select the best option uh, to kind of reflect with a critical mind to your own kind of achievements, then you block the cycle at another way. So either way, you lose the, the, the kind of uh, momentum. And either way, you are losing, actually, creativity. So rechanneling creativity is a very important act, which is needing creativity itself. So we need to be creative uh, to deal with this problem as well. Um, as a kind of summary, uh, referring to the, to, the, to the ideas of uh, Roland Person in a different kind of uh, formulation, perhaps, Talents are the life insurance of our world. Why? Because we have that many new challenges as it was summarized by Roland, and we need novel solutions for these challenges and talents, gifted people, are the ultimately best sources of these novel solutions. However, there is a question which might be put that if talents are the life insurance of the world, but what is the life insurance of talents? Uh, well, the answer is quite easy. It is a talent-friendly society. That gives them assurance, that gives them uh, uh, stability, and that gives them possibility to grow. It is, another, in another formulation, talent needs space to grow, and eventually positivity creates this space. Uh, uh, talent is able to fly in this way, as uh, one of the American websites uh, abbreviated, First, love yourself. Uh, this, this is actually a very important precondition to fly. Well, you learned it here in the United States very well. Uh, we have to learn it in Hungary. Hungary is not really well known about self-love, uh, so we have to exercise it. But that's why I'm here, uh, among others. Uh, uh, once again, I, I'm quoting Todd Lubert, who, who was talking about creative climate. Now, this way of, of, of positivity is the very same kind of expression, generally, as the creative climate uh, uh, formulated by Todd. Uh, even only one smile may make a miracle. I will introduce you some smiles which, uh, which, which, which you may find interesting. Uh, the mischievous smile, the, the trust smile, the self-confident smile, and the love flow smile are all smiles which make the world better, which make the world more receptive, which make the world more reflective for any type of novelty, including talents, including giftedness. But most of all, I would like to uh, draw your attention, the smiles of the inner peace, what you can acquire when you are getting old and wise. And I will show you some old and wise faces which all acquired this smile of inner peace. Uh, uh, no wonder that these faces are quite alike, and no wonder that we cherish 
some of them or another one uh, quite much uh, according to our cultures or beliefs. Um, so as a summary, talent needs the support of the society, but also the modern society needs the support of their talented. And once again, this is the creative climate uh, introduced before. And this goes to the second part of my talk, which will be much shorter than the first one, which will summarize the network concept of talent support itself. First, I would like to introduce you, uh, which is a few steps toward the talent-friendly society. And first, I would like to introduce you a talent support network, which I established uh, approximately 18 years ago in 1996. Uh, and it is about high school students who have the opportunity of research. Top level research, actually, at universities or academy institutions, and real research. So research which is not compromised under any means uh, for young people. That is the top science, what can be pers pursued in that particular country, which is actually Hungary in this point. Uh, the student is getting uh, self-selection at the very first step because it's, the student has to answer to two questions. The first question, why am I interested in science? Why do I think I am interested in scientific research? And the second question, why do I think I am better than the average of the students in my school or in my acquaintances? But we accept all answers. So it is not the question what type of an answer we get. It is the question whether we get an answer at all. Because science at this level requires independency and requires a kind of maturity. And this maturity and independency is quite well screened by these two questions, however simple they seem to be, uh, because it, it, it gives you a sense of self-reflection, uh, how the student is thinking about herself or himself. Second, the student is enrolling himself or herself to this program, gets a mentor list, which is a list of approximately 800 best professors of the country. But the student has to select her or his field uh, without a kind of centralized help. This is again a screen, because the student has to decide what is interesting from these 800 or 1,000 options, what I can enter. Uh, obviously, if the student has difficulties and asks for help, then we give help. But help is not obvious. Help is not kind of uh, automatic. Help comes only if I formulate my question, if I am kind of um, uh, mature enough uh, to formulate the question. Obviously, after that comes research, and then we organize a lot of opportunities to show the results for the students and to give them networking opportunities to know each other, to know the best persons in the country. During the last 18 years, more than 12,000 students went through this process. Uh, this is, uh, as an average, 1,000 students per year. Uh, and from these 1,000 student, ap students, approximately half of them, eight, uh, 500, are reaching the point that they accomplish a scientific inquiry in their age between 16 to 18. Sometimes in the age of 11, sometimes in the age of 19. So it is kind of flexible. It is depending on the student. It is not depending on any kind of regulation. Uh, I will introduce you to students uh, who were not only successful in science, but actually uh, were leading this whole project. This whole project is not led by teachers, by professors, but this project is led by the students themselves, the students in the age of 16 to 18. So this is a nationwide project spending like $100,000 per year, which is led by 18 to to, to 16 to 18 years old students. And they grew up to lead this whole project and to oversee the complexity of the business, to oversee the complexity of fundraising, and to oversee to help to the other, to the other persons. One of the persons whom I am introducing is Tomas Reves. He wrote, he is a war historian. He wrote two books, two monographs, by the age of 18 about war history. They were actually published. Uh, he led the whole project by the age of 19 and now studies at the King's College in London uh, to introduce a new area of science to Hungary uh, because uh, it hasn't been practiced before in the Hungarian war history. 
The other person I'm introducing to you is Katalin Shuyok. Katalin uh, had a multi-awarded research on environmental law. Uh, she actually has two uh, degrees in from law and from biology as well, and she, she passed these two universities at the same time. Uh, and she was leading this whole project, uh, and she organized a, uh, a nationwide conference in the age of 16 uh, and went on, and now she's the vice president of the nationwide uh, talent support project. I will introduce you in a minute. The third ever young person I would like to introduce you today, a uh, talented person, is Joseph Renzulli. Uh, he was not participating in this project, but I'm quoting him because this uh, behavior, what is exemplified by these two students, is, is, is exactly the social capital and leadership among young people, what was the major topics of his talk. Uh, this is a very important aspect of our talent support program in Hungary, and there are hundreds of students, if not thousands by now, who are acquiring these skills uh, um, in the country. This network has been expanded to a nationwide, to a, to a multinational network, the network of youth excellence, as it has been already um, uh, uh, mentioned in an introduction uh, in 2000, and it has now 18 member organizations. So if you have an organization which is active for uh, in the high school, range students, so in the age of 16 to 18, and giving them research, then please uh, visit the website uh, uh, nyex.de. Uh, Germany is the uh, center of this network currently, uh, and join to the network. Uh, this network was actually growing in Hungary, uh, not only in science, but in arts and sports. And we have by now approximately 1,000 uh, talent points in the country, and not only in the country, but in the neighboring countries as well. These talent points are schools, nurseries, universities, um, uh, carpentry shops, even uh, penitentiaries for young uh, 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 adolescents uh, have been joining us uh, to, this, to this adventure. And these are uh, institutions which have their own programs for the, for the gifted students, gifted children, and they are also open for advice to anyone, parents, teachers, students, the, uh, youngsters who are approaching them. Uh, this is a kind of network, so they are knowing about each other, they are transferring students from one institution to another, if the other institution can give a better help than the one, and they are forming actually councils now by themselves, so it's a kind of um, 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 self-organized uh, uh, situation. Uh, there are 100 talent support councils in Hungary already in mathematics by region, uh, uh, about Roma talent support, which is an ethnic minority in the country, by religions, by any type of aspects of talent or motivation what can move people uh, to help uh, in this area. There were 15,000 teachers who were trained in the last two years to, de to, 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 to see or to, to uh, observe talented, gifted students in their classrooms. And there were 26,000 talents discovered and helped in this program. Uh, the program is run by donations, tax donations in the country. There were more than almost 300,000 people who had donations in the last year. So it became a nationwide movement. Hungary has only 10 million people. So this is kind of 3% of the population uh, as such. So approximately 3% of the population is involved in one way or another uh, in this talent support movement in my country. The uh, legislation accepted a 20 year, old, 20 year long talent support program. So the parliament and the government. Uh, so it has kind of long term stability. The next level of network I would like to introduce to you or show you is uh, the European Council of High Ability, ECHA itself, which has 25 years of high-level traditions of best practices of Europe-wide uh, talent support activities and, 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 uh, and, and research. And I'm very happy to show you that four of the committee members, which is actually half of the committee of ECHA, are participants of this conference. Uh, besides the two speakers today, uh, Lian and Victor are also members, I mean, participants uh, of, this, of this conference, which is very important and very uh, uh, good. Uh, there is an increasing knowledge about talent support activities in Europe. There is a talent support activity map, which is, uh, which is assembled and there are more and more uh, activities and countries uh, in this map. 
and we have plans for the future. We would like to establish a European talent support network when countries are helping each other and, and programs are helping each other. And eventually these plans acquired a support, initial support from the European Parliament and from the European Commission. So by next year, perhaps we, we may start and we may uh, develop a new level of cooperation in a continent-wide manner uh, in, in the European continent uh, concerning talent support. Now, my last three slides show you some hints how to build a successful talent support network. Now, the first hint is that you should make horizontal contacts instead of hierarchy. And as you see, if you make hierarchical contacts, then when the top level guys look down, they see only what you see on the picture. And when the bottom level guys look up, then they see only what you see on the picture. Uh, so certainly this is not a way to do a kind of efficient networking and I certainly don't want to be a president of ECHA like that poor uh, uh, bird on the top. Uh, so horizontal contacts are very important in network building. But the second kind of take home message is that we should build a kind of we world instead of a me world. Talented persons are having a very, very big identity, a very, very big ego most of the time. Uh, the largest, larger ego is what we have, talent supporters. I mean, if you look around, I mean, not on this, but in, in another kind of uh, uh, room, when talent supporting people are assembled, you do see egos. And this is well, this is good. This is really important because we have our own way, we have our own kind of experience, and we are be, uh, very proud of that. But we have to break these walls. And we have to kind of join our forces and kind of recognize the other's values. And this is the we world instead of the me world. This is very well served by networking. And finally, networking, good networking is building a trust space. It's building a space which helps people uh, 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 to, to enjoy themselves and to get that positivity, which is, which is developing that talent. My final quotation is for Khalil Gibran. Gibran was a, a, a philosopher uh, originally in Lebanon, but finally he lived in the United States. And he told that work is actually love made visible. Now, I would like to extend his original way of thinking because he was thinking when he was uh, uh, formulating this sentence that you should love your work. And he was right. Because if you love your work, then you can acquire the flow, what was described by Csikszentmihalyi, that kind of um, uh, emotional and, and, uh, and, and mental status, which gives you a successful work. But I would like to extend this knowledge, because your work is for someone. It is not only for yourself, it is for someone else. And you have to love that someone whom you don't even know when you work. And if you love that someone who will be the beneficiary of your work, then you understand really the meaning of this single sentence that work is love made visible. Actually, talent support is love made visible in this sense. And I wish you a wonderful experience and joy in this exercise. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Peter Schmel, for this insightful and inspiring lecture. Thank you very much.